Thank you for attending the CAS Millercom lecture given in conjunction with the 60th anniversary of the School of Social Work. Our mission is to promote the values of the social work profession through a commitment to diversity and social justice. The lecture today helps us further that mission. I want to be sure to thank the co-sponsors of today's lecture who are listed in the program announcement the Center for Advanced Study, of course, the College of Agriculture, Consumer and Environmental Sciences, Colleges of Business, Law, Fine and Applied Arts, Medicine, Graduate School of Library and Information Science, the Institute of Government and Public Affairs, University Library, Institute of Labor and Industrial Relations, and the Program on Women and Gender and Global Perspectives. Clearly many are sharing in our mission today. It is my pleasure to introduce Jason DeParle. Mr. DeParle is a senior writer for the New York Times and a contributor to the New York Times Magazine. A graduate of Duke University, his first post as a journalist was at the New Orleans Times-Picayune. Many of us have been following his reporting on poverty, race, and welfare for many years. He won a George Polk Award in 1999 and has been a two-time finalist for the Pulitzer Prize for his reporting on the welfare system. His book, American Dream, Three Women, Ten Kids, and a Nation's Drive to End Welfare helps us see that neither progressives nor conservatives predicted the outcome of welfare reform and that those outcomes could not be contained in a slogan like ending welfare as we knew it. His willingness to seek multiple explanations should help him on his current assignment, the diaspora created by Hurricane Katrina. I welcome Mr. DeParle for his talk, A Shot at the American Dream. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you very much, Wynne. Um, I'm, uh, I'm very pleased uh, to be here, uh, and especially uh, honored to see my friend uh, Leon Dash uh, here. Leon, as I'm sure you all know, is one of the great uh, great men of journalism, and I, I learned a tremendous amount uh, from him before I uh, ever uh, even met him. Uh, when I was first starting out in journalism, uh, I went to see the film Eleni. I don't know if any of you remember this. It's a story of a, a true story of a New York Times reporter who gets his dream assignment. Um, the guy's name was Nicholas Gage, and his dream assignment was the Athens Bureau uh, for the New York Times. His mother had been murdered in the Greek Civil War. And he wanted to go to Athens and find out who had killed his mother. And the film starts with him walking out of the executive editor's office at the New York Times. And he goes home and he tells his wife, honey, I got the job. And I thought this was just one of the great glamour scenes of journalism. You know, I was 23 years old. Imagine being at the New York Times and walking out of the, your boss's office with your, the assignment of your life. In the course of working on my book, I had my equivalent moment. Only my dream was to spend a year in Milwaukee. Uh, <laughs> writing about welfare offices. And uh, I had to go in and sell the executive editor of the New York Times on, on the notion. He was a little skeptical, my, my boss, Joe Lellyville. Uh, he thought if we were going to spend a whole year just writing about one city, we should do it in our readership area rather than go halfway across the country. But I tried to persuade him that New Orleans was a cauldron of policy innovation, and there was much to be learned there, Joe. And this will redound to your credit as an editor, Joe, to have somebody there on the ground to observe it, bring it to your readers. And, he heard me out and finally said, okay, okay, you can go. And he walked me to the door and he put his arm around me and he said, you know, I've been, to New uh, I've been to Milwaukee. And I thought, this is it. This is my Eleni moment, you know. This is going to say, Joe was one of my great heroes in journalism. He's going to say, I've been to Milwaukee and you know, I'm, you're going to make solid Midwestern friendships that will last a lifetime. Or you, I've been to Milwaukee and I know this story is going to test your soul. And instead, Joe put his arm around me and said, I I've been to Milwaukee, so I know your motives are pure. <clears throat> it's not like you're trying to go to Honolulu. And, and with that, my, my adventure was begun. Um, the, the product is a, a book called American Dream. It, it takes its title from Bill Clinton's uh, first welfare speech as president, an obscure line in his first welfare speech as president, in which he said, I think we all know in our heart of hearts that too many of our people never get a shot at the American dream. Uh, I'll give you a quick overview of the book, and I mostly want to talk about 
the main character, a woman named Angela Job. Uh, the book starts with two coincidental but colliding events, both of them in, in October 1991. Two things uh, seemingly interrelated, uh, unrelated happen. Uh, the first is that two women in Chicago, Angela Job and Jewel Reed, get on a bus and move to Milwaukee to start new lives on, on welfare. They had been on welfare in Chicago, but the real way they were paying the rent was through their boyfriends who were selling drugs. Their boyfriends went to jail in the summer of 1991. They had no way to pay the rent anymore. If you took your entire welfare grant in Chicago and gave it to your landlord, it still wouldn't be enough to cover the rent. Rents were so high and, uh, and uh, stipends were so low. 90 miles up the road in Milwaukee, the arithmetic was reversed. Grants were higher, rents were lower. You could rent an apartment and still have a little bit of money left over at the end of the month. That's all they knew about Milwaukee when they got on the bus to go. They certainly didn't know they were moving to the place that would become uh, the epicenter of the, of the end welfare movement. Uh, in time, uh, Angie and Jewel are cousins. Over time, they, they recruited a third cousin, Opal, Opal Caples, to come up and live with them. And the three of them established uh, what I sometimes would think of as a central city kibbutz or a, or a welfare sorority. They, they mo moved in together, shared a house. They were in their early 20s and uh, aided each other in raising their kids, formed a, you know, a social, an integrated social network and, and um, lived there on welfare for five years. Uh, at the same time, October 1991, the Angie and Jewel were getting on the bus to move to uh, Milwaukee. Bill Clinton gave the first speech of his, uh, first domestic policy speech of his long shot campaign for governor in which he promised for the first time to end welfare as we know it. Uh, by the way, n nobody noticed at the time this was uh, to become quite a famous phrase. Uh, the New York Times didn't cover the speech and the Washington Post covered it but didn't focus on the phrase end welfare as we know it. Over time, however, that gathered a momentum and ended up, uh, as you all know, toppling six decades of social welfare policy. So I sometimes think of the, the narrative structure of the book like one of those maritime disaster stories, you know, the perfect storm. You see, uh, you see the women sort of sailing off on the horizon, uh, oblivious of what's coming. You see the gathering policy storm in, uh, in, in Washington. The two meet midway through the book. Uh, Milwaukee becomes the first place in the country to implement tough welfare laws. Two of the three women wound up leaving the roles and getting quickly became full-time steady workers, uh, to my surprise. And uh, the third had a more tragic journey through the welfare system than I would have imagined possible. So there were surprises in both directions. Um, one other aspect of the book I'd like to mention just quickly in passing has to do with the family background. Now, these are three cousins, uh, three African-American cousins. And I got very interested in their family history one day when Jewel's mother came up uh, to visit and I asked her unsuspectingly, uh, her, her name's Hattie Mae Crenshaw, Miss Crenshaw, tell me about your life, where are you from? And she answered with one of the sentences I think will never leave me as a journalist, one of the most memorable things I, I've ever heard. She looked at me and said, Jason, I was born in Doddsville, Mississippi in 1937 on Senator Jim Eastland's plantation. That's a time when black peoples was just beginning to come out of slavery. Now, I, I looked at her with a slightly dropped jaw, and um, I thought, what in the world is she talking about? 1937, slavery, and could she really be from the Eastland Plantation? Now, James Eastland is a name that may mean a lot to a few of you and, and nothing to most of you, but Eastland was one of the last towering segregationists of the South. He was chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee for 22 years during the Civil Rights era and used to go around boasting that he had a vest pocket where all the civil rights bills went to die. So was she really from the Eastland Plantation? It's just something she heard in the family. You know, journalists have a way of talking about stories when you hear something like that, you know, good if true. This would be interesting if in fact it's true. And um, we have another category we don't usually discuss in public called Too Good to Check. <clears throat> uh, uh, <laughs> this came perilously close, but I, I did check it, and uh, not only was it true, in the summer of 2000, I went down to the Eastland Plantation. It was still in the Eastland family. James Eastland's son, Woods Eastland, was still living there, and so was Hattie May's 85-year-old uncle, Mac Caples, who had been there since 1927, when James Eastland's father 
had driven him and his father across Mississippi and settled them on this land in, uh, in, the, in the Mississippi Delta. So I got fascinated with the story of the, the family history. Uh, my editor, I have to say, my book editor was not fascinated with the story of the family history. She was um, hoping I would actually finish the book sometimes, and she kept saying, you're you're not Nick Lemon. You don't need to. You're not writing the history of the of the uh, black migration. You're writing about Milwaukee in the 1990s. You know, get back up there. Um, I called her back six months later and said, "Wendy, Wendy, I got it. You know, some new piece of genealogy." I eventually traced the story back six generations. So the book I thought I was writing about Milwaukee in the late 1990s. Um, the book now starts in Mississippi in the early 1830s with the arrival of uh, Opal's Angie and Jules' great great grandfather. Um, a man named Frank Cables as a slave in Mississippi. And the story unfolds from there through um, slavery, emancipation, um, their lives as sharecroppers. Eventually they, they move to Chicago and, uh, and then the second migration up to Milwaukee. Um, but as I said, mo what I mostly like to talk about is, is Angie. When the book first came out uh, last year, she came to Washington and she did an interview, uh, or we did an interview together on National Public Radio. And she did just, yeah, I was a little tense about it, but she did fantastic. Um, Sorry she's not here today, but I'll, with your permission, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll beam her in a little bit and um, describe her to you the best way I know how, which is how I describe her in the book. The month Bill Clinton announced he was running for president, she stepped off a Greyhound bus in Milwaukee to start a new life. She was 25 years old and arrived from Chicago towing two large duffel bags and three young kids. Angie had a pretty milk chocolate face and a fire plug build. Her four foot 11 inch frame carried 150 pounds and the combination could make her look tender or tough, depending on her mood. She had never seen Milwaukee before and pronounced herself unimpressed. Why they got all these old ass houses, she groused, where the brick at? Irreverence was Angie's religion. She arrived in Milwaukee as she moved through the world, a short stout fountain of exclamation points, half of them capping sentences that would peel paint from the bus station walls. You could see why I was nervous about taking her over to National Public Radio. <laughs> Absent or animating humor, the transcript may sound off pudding, but up close, her habit of excitable swearing came off as something akin to charm. I just expressed myself so accurately, she laughed. The cascade of off color commentary flowing alongside the late night cans of Colt 45 could make Angie seem like a jaded veteran of ghetto life. Certainly, she had plenty to feel jaded about. She grew up on the borders of Chicago's gangland. Her father was a drunk. She had her first baby at 17, dropped out of high school, and had two more in quick succession. She didn't have a diploma or a job, and the man she loved was in jail. By the time she arrived in Milwaukee, she had been on welfare for nearly eight years, the sum of her adult life. Her hard face was real, but also a mask. Her mother had worked two jobs to send her to parochial school. And though Angie tried to hide it, she still bore traces of the English student from Aquinas High. Lots of women came to Milwaukee looking for welfare checks. Not many then felt the need to start a poem about their efforts to discern God's will. I'm tired of trying to understand what God wants of me, she wrote. Then worried that was too irreverent, Angie substituted the world for God and hid the unfinished page in a bag so high in her closet she couldn't reach it with a chair. Stories of street fights Angie was happy to share, but the bag was so private that hardly anyone knew it existed. Don't you know I like looking mean, she said one day. If people think you're nice, they'll take your kindness for weakness. That's a side of me I don't want anybody to see. That way I don't have to worry about nobody hurting me. Um, I was telling Leon about this a little bit last night. Angie had her whole inner life hidden in this dirty vinyl red vinyl bag in the back of her closet. And I didn't know about it for years, literally. Um, I think three years had gone by before I got any clue uh, of what was in it or that it even existed. I'd written a whole chapter, a, a first draft of a chapter about her her adolescence, about her getting pregnant and dropping out of high school. Um, based on, I probably had interviewed her 10 times and asked, what was it like for you to get pregnant and drop out of high school? And she said again and again, it was no big deal, it was no big deal, you just get on with your life. No big deal, no big deal. So I never liked, I wrote, you know, she, here was this girl, she went to high school, she got pregnant, she dropped out, didn't give it a second thought, no big deal. And I never liked the chapter because it didn't capture what I experienced as her emotional complexity or sensitivity or thoughtfulness. Um, I showed it to a friend and he said it got his inner Archie Bunker going. 
you know, the notion of this girl unthinkingly dropping out of high school, which was really alarming because I didn't know he had an inner Archie bunker, you know, and I, I didn't want to be pers responsible for activating it. So I was really kind of struggling with this material. I said, Angie, I'm pleading. You know, what, what was going through your mind when you got pregnant? She finally lets on that she had kept a journal in high school, and she would written in it the day that she got found out she was pregnant. And what she wrote was the exact opposite of what she told me. She finally got out the journal and she read it to me. She said in the journal, I'm going to have to change my life. I have a new life within me. So all along she's telling me it was no big deal. She was telling herself at the very moment that it was a profound big deal. She knew it even then. Um, you know, with, uh, as a journalist, you, usually, you meet typically when you get to know somebody, you meet their more polished, sensitive, accomplished, public face first, and you spend time with them and a more complex portrait emerges. With Angie, she was much more um, comfortable showing me her hardened street side. She was much quicker to tell me about the time she pulled a switchblade on her stepfather than she was to talk about her feelings or to share her poetry. So, um, and I would plead with her, Angie, this will make you look better. And that just made her close up more. You know, she wanted to appear, uh, it was much more threatening to her to sort of appear soft. So we were in a, in a unproductive dynamic for a few years of me uh, trying to get her to show, show her inner poet um, until she finally, I think, just got tired of my hectoring and got out of her journal. Um, mostly I want to talk about Angie as a worker. And uh, I'd like to talk about it th um, through three lenses, what her work meant to her personally, what it meant to her financially, and then what it meant to her kids. Uh, Angie had been on welfare for 12 years. She had no high school degree. She had four kids. She was just the kind of person that so many people, including me, thought would be disadvantaged by this law. You know, who's gonna, what's going to happen when they, when they put in the, the, the time limits on welfare? Who's going to hire her? Who's going to take care of the kids? How is she going to be able to support herself? Um, and within six months, she was off the rolls and on the job as a full-time steady worker. She was much more able to work than I think the expert community would have given, that most people would have, would have thought, than particularly the social scientists would have thought, and, and, and most journalists. Um, and that's some good news, and, and there, is, there is good news in, in her, some good news in her story. Um, Angie went to work as a, as a certified nursing assistant in, in a nursing home. Uh, this is a line of work I had never had occasion to think about. I imagine some people uh, at a school of social work have. Um, you, you all, I'm sure, know more about it than I did when I started, but it's, you know, nursing aides do difficult, uh, dirty, dangerous work. The, uh, um, the difficult and the dirty is intuitive enough. You traffic in infectious fluids, you deal with bedpans. Um, the dangerous is something that came, I have to say, as a surprise to me. Uh, I came to discover that nursing aides actually get injured more often than coal miners. Uh, it's from all the lifting they do. They're constantly lifting people out of beds, in and off, out of wheelchairs, in and out of the shower. Uh, I, I was uh, sure this had to be a misprint, and I kept calling back the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Could this possibly be true? Uh, the, uh, oh, it's him again. Yeah, it's still true. Um, uh, <clears throat> they uh, make about $7.50 an hour on average as Angie, uh, went, at the time that Angie joined the, the workforce. Uh, about uh, although they provide health care to other people all day, uh, one in four have no health insurance themselves, and about one out of five live below the poverty line. You know, it's a taxing, um, physically difficult, economically unrewarding job, the subject of a lot of scatological humor in welfare offices, and Angie loved it. She liked almost everything about it, except for the pay. She liked the brightly lit nursing home, the clean place to go every day. She liked the teamwork of patient care. She liked the gossip in the break room. She liked her uniform. She liked getting up in the morning and thinking of herself as a, as a nurse. Uh, she really liked her patients. Um, I, there was something about Angie's work that brought out a latent empathy in her, a, a real uh, compassion. I, I, I used to tease uh, Angie that she, she had more patience for her patients than she did for her kids. To which Angie would re respond, well, look at my kids, you know, <laughs> wouldn't you? Um, the, but the joking aside, the, it, it, it allowed her to be somebody she couldn't be at home or on the streets. It allowed you know, her to relax that, that hardened face. Um, early on in Angie's experience as a nursing aide, uh, she went to take care of, um, 
I'll give, give you one example of what, what it brought out in Angie. She went to take care of a frail, frightened, elderly white woman who I believe had soiled herself. And Angie's a four foot, 11 inch African American woman, goes over to clean her up, and the woman looks up at her and barks out a racial epithet. Get your hands off me, you, you know what. On the street with Angie, those would be fighting words, you know. Uh, in the nursing home, she just laughed. She kind of cackled at the woman. She said, well, the you-know-what is taking care of you because you can't do it yourself, so you might as well just let me. Gave her kind of, you know, sort of one of these uh, sort of a, a f uh, feigned um, indignation uh, lecture and then went about cleaning her up. And I asked her about it afterwards, and she said, oh, well, old people, they're stuck in their ways. They... Maybe she, they're raised a certain way to raise to be prejudiced or they're not entirely in, in control of their minds. Or she had some explanation about why this woman was the way she was and why it was still her obligation, her social duty uh, uh, to take care of uh, another person. Um, it, was, it, it, it was a lovely unfolding to see that uh, come out in Angie. Bill Clinton, when he talked about, um, when he was advocating the, the welfare bill, used to talk about work as um, a form of social uplift, civic connectedness, social glue. He had a lot of the kind of fancy phrases about uh, the non-economic rewards of work, the spiritual uplift that could come from work. And I have to say I was uh, at times skeptical. I mean, work can be those things. We'd all like to think there's a moral component to our work, but it can also be a form of drudgery or exploitation or abuse. It very much depends on the context. Um, Despite my con my initial skepticism, I, I, I in, have to say that in Angie's case, I think um, work did have some of that, um, those spiritual, uh, if you'll forgive the word, rewards that Clinton talked about. It did become a way that she could connect to other people. I'm not just talking about her own personal self-esteem, although there was some of that too, um, but it became a, a way that uh, she bonded with other people and, and, and expressed a sort of public morality. Um, so there's two pieces of good news in her story. She was more able to work than we might have imagined her to be, and, um, and she liked working. The bad news is it didn't pay. Um, Angie uh, released her welfare and earnings records for about 10 years, going back 10 years uh, to me. These are administrative records that the state kept, public aid records, and also uh, her wages as reported to the State Department of Labor for unemployment insurance. So it was, it was good data. This wasn't, I could reconstruct her finances not just by asking her to remember how much she had made years earlier, but, but with actual data. So when you uh, compare her last five years on welfare with her first three years off and uh, adjust for inflation and adjust for welfare going down and wages going up and figuring taxes, it looks like she's up about $3,400 a year. In her case, that would be about a 15% annual raise. Not life transforming by any means, but still, you know, step forward, and um, none of us would uh, would walk away from a 15% raise. Um, it seems like you know, modestly good work. The problem is it doesn't account for work expenses. If you take even a, a very modest estimate of, of transportation alone, you'd wipe out nearly half of that gain. Um, plus, there's going to be some childcare costs. In Angie's case, they they were modest because she mostly left the kids to mind themselves, um, which created other problems. At one point, Keisha, her oldest uh, daughter was 11 taking care of three younger siblings. Um, you know, cre created other problems besides financial problems. Plus Angie lost her health insurance for uh, the first three years she was off the rolls. Um, my best guess is when you factor all that in, it's about a wash or maybe a few hundred bucks a year to the good. Um, but what really struck me about Angie's situation economically wasn't so much the before and after welfare. It was just how much economic hardship there was in Angie's life in either case. Um, Angie and Jewel, for that matter, out-earned nearly 85% of the people coming off of welfare. Uh, they're as good, about as good as it gets. These are success stories. Nonetheless, Angie lost her electricity three times in three years. Um, she, as I said, went without health insurance for the better part of three years. And she ran short on food more often, really more often than I could, not, not even more often than I expected, but more often than I could count. Um, in part because it was one of the things that Angie didn't like to talk about. If I asked her directly, uh, are you running short on food, she would well up with indignation. You know, ain't, ain't nobody starving around here. Uh, but I slowly began to realize that a lot of the fights in the house were fights uh, at some level about food. Uh, Opal, the third cousin, moved in at one point and um, put her 
food under her bed and put a padlock on the door. So there's you know, one, one sign, even for a slow-witted uh, journalist, that, that food is a problem in the house. Uh, on Angie's uh, 33rd birthday, I stopped by the nursing home, wish her happy birthday. And as I was leaving, uh, she said, uh, which way are you going? I said, oh, no, no, I don't know, no plans. Who, where, where are you going next? No plans. Well, are you going by the Wendy's? And I realized it's 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, she hasn't eaten all day. She didn't want to ask me directly, but yeah, it pieced it together. She hadn't eaten. Um, one night I stopped by Angie's house about 8 o'clock at night, and a big fight erupted between Angie's daughter, Keisha, who is now at this point 14, and Angie's boyfriend, Marcus. Marcus walks in, the house is a mess, he starts screaming, the kids start screaming back, he hits one of them, kids running around, it's a big you know, fracas in the house, goes on for a half hour, Angie's busy at work, um, and finally Keisha turns to Marcus in the middle of this and says, Marcus, what do you expect? It's 9 o'clock and we haven't eaten, we're hungry. So this is a fight about a lot of different things, it's a fight about Marcus's authority, whether or not he's supposed to be in the house, whether the kids have to listen, you know, listen, to, uh, listen to him. Um, but it's also at just some base level a fight about hungry kids. I mean, uh, 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 kids going hungry. It wouldn't have surprised me if you had told me that some people leaving welfare for work would have problems keeping food in the house. Some people, yeah, I would have expected that. I think it would have surprised me to the extent I can recreate what my mindset was before um, the welfare bill passed. I think it would have surprised me to, th to, to think that somebody who out earns nearly nine out of ten people uh, coming off the welfare rolls would chronically run short on food. Um, uh, as I said, Angie also lost her health insurance, although she's providing health care to other people all day. Um, Angie, for the most part, was healthy, so in her case that was, I think, an abomination, but not an immediate economic crisis. Uh, Jewel also was working in a nursing home. Jewel also lost her health insurance, and Jewel had bleeding ulcers. So Jewel was hospitalized at one point to take care of her ulcers and had her wages garnished to pay back the hospital bill. And she thought so little of this that she didn't even tell me, here's somebody I'm seeing every other day, every third day. The way I discovered it is I walked in her house and found that she was heating her house with her oven. So I said, Jewel, why are you heating your house with the oven? Um, she couldn't afford the heating oil. We kind of go back and forth a little bit. We, she finally tells me the story about the, the hospital bill. And I must have registered a, a look of surprise because she looks surprised that I seem surprised. And then Jewel said, well, everybody who goes to work is going to owe a hospital bill. Everybody, everybody in Milwaukee gets their wages garnished. This was her expectation of what happens when you leave welfare to go to work. If I could step out of my own um, narrative here, where are we? We've got Angie's better able to work than we would have expected. She likes work maybe more than we have a right to expect. Work doesn't pay. Her work, you know, she's just as poor as she's always been. Um, if I were to step out of my own <clears throat> perspective on the story, and, uh, as I tried to do in the writing, sometimes I would try to beam in other people and see what, from the, their lens, how would they look at this? If I could beam in a supporter of the bill, Newt Gingrich, right? Uh, what would he say about this? Well, I think somebody could say uh, the conservatives, the supporters of the welfare law could, could, uh, say, could and would say something like this. Okay, Angie's had dug herself a pretty big hole in life. She was 30 years old. She dropped out of high school. She'd had four kids. She doesn't have uh, any real skills. Any doesn't have many real skills. Um, <clears throat> it's unrealistic to think that in a few years she's going to be able to turn her life around economically. But at least she's off of welfare. She's working. She has the potential now for a raise. You know, you weren't gonna, well, she wasn't going to get out of poverty as long as she stayed on welfare. Now she's in the workforce. There's a chance to move up over time. But the real payoff of this social experiment is going to be in the next generation. It's going to be in her kids. This, I, mean, I think that would be the big uh, the big hope from this law. Now the kids are going to see the mom going to work. There's going to be a new discipline in the house. The kids are going to have raised aspirations. They're going to see how hard mom has to work if she, and they're going to stay stay in school and study harder. You know, it's a, it's an obvious thing to hope for. Um, all of us who are working parents hope that our work sets um, some example for for our kids. I don't I don't mean to belittle it, um, but it's also the place where I have to say what I saw on the ground in Milwaukee, it's the place that it most diverged from the Washington policy conversation. 
You know, Bill Clinton, when he talked about, this was not just Gingrich's vision, I think, of welfare, uh, the welfare bill, but, but Clinton's as well. He used to tell the story of a woman named uh, Lily Hardin. He had her at the, at the Rose Garden the day he signed the, the welfare bill. Um, and the story, which he must have told 10 times during his presidency, had to do with Lily Hardin's son. Clinton first met this woman when he was uh, governor of Arkansas, and he asked her what was the best thing about getting off welfare. As Clinton always told the story, she looked me in the eye and she said, now when my son goes to school and they ask your mama, what does he do, what does she do, he can give an answer. You know, that to Clinton was, that was success. That was the hopes that he was trying to, 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 to breed with the welfare bill. Uh, and he brought Lily Hardin to the Rose Garden as a symbol of it. But between the time that Clinton first told that story uh, as governor and the time you know, he repeated it as, uh, in the Rose Garden as president, that son had gone to jail for a shooting, that teenage son. So the very person that he thought was a symbol that you know, a working mother would, would, would breed success among her, her kids um, was in trouble at that, at that very time. He went on in the past 10 years. He's been arrested 20 times. He's a career criminal in, in North Little Rock. Um, I, none of it by any means means, do I mean to belittle the hard efforts of Lily Harden, who I actually got to know a little bit, but it's just a, a reminder that simply moving a mother from welfare to work does not necessarily change um, the life trajectory of her children. In, in Angie's case, nothing so um, dire as a, as a shooting uh, occurred. The kids didn't wind up in, in jail, thank God, um, but she didn't become a role model for, for them um, either. Uh, to, if anything, I think they experienced her work as an absence rather than an inspiration. Uh, I'm sure some of you are familiar with a um, wonderful book by my friend Alex Kotlowitz, There Are No Children Here. Uh, I used to think of Angie's house sometimes as there are no parents here. You know, Angie was just away more often uh, at, at the nursing home. The night that big fight broke out between um, Keisha and Marcus, one of the younger kids crying, up, great you know, tumult in the household, he runs across the street to the payphone calls his mother at the nursing home and the supervisor says, I'm sorry, she's busy with patients. She can't come, can't come to the phone. So it's 9 o'clock at night, hungry kids, a potentially violent boyfriend. Um, you know, that, uh, that's how they were experiencing uh, Angie going to work. Her, their school absences actually rose in the years uh, after she uh, left welfare. They had missed um, an average of 21% uh, of their school days before she left, and it rose to 26 after the, after they left. I don't want to suggest for a minute that you know things were great in the household when she was on welfare. I don't know that things. I don't want to suggest that, that you know, the kids would have been a lot better off had she stayed on welfare. But certainly leaving was not was not their salvation. Um, the kids did have a role model. It was Jewel's boyfriend, Ken. Um, so their auntie. These are Angie's kids. So their auntie's boyfriend, Ken, who was a drug dealer, and a pimp. But he was also the one guy in the neighborhood who had money and status and time and interest in the kids, the one guy who would take them to the park and buy them meals and take them uh, to, to McDonald's and take them to jazz music fest on the weekends. So when Red, Angie's oldest son, got into um, eighth grade, they asked him to write an essay about the American city um, that he would most like to visit. And Red wrote that he wanted to go to Las Vegas, quote, because Hoenn is legal out there. <laughs> so I used to, I'd be, I would sit in a lot of Washington seminars, and people would always say, but now that she's going to work, I'll bet the kids are, they're just doing so much better. I would think of Red, you know, because Hoenn is legal out there. Um, so Angie likes working. She's able to work. She likes working, but the work doesn't pay, and it doesn't seem to do much to the kids. Where, where did that direct me in the end? Um, uh, it directed me for, to a place where I hadn't really thought I would wind up uh, a place I didn't have in mind in the beginning, which was the, the directed me towards the men. Um, you know, it's a staple of after-dinner speech that um, generation after generation of kids grows up uh, in the in central city without seeing anybody get up and go to work. I mean, you've all heard variations, you know, no alarm clocks ringing in the house. We've all heard some version of that story. Um, that really did not capture what I saw uh, uh, in, in the families that I got to know at all. Angie, Opal, uh, and Jewel, all three of them grew up with working mothers. Uh, two of the three of them became working mothers. There were lots of other people in the neighborhood. They, these, you know, the kids grew up seeing people go to work. I think the truism that came closer to truth had to do with the men. Um, 
none of them grew up with a stable father. Uh, and all of them, you know, none of the, the subtitle of the book is three women and ten kids in a nation's drive to end welfare. None of the three women, none of the ten kids had grown up with a stable father in the house. And they all expressed it to me at some point or another as a source of sadness or loss or grief in their life. And it wasn't something that I went in asking about. It wasn't something that was consciously on my mind when, when I began. Uh, I'll give you an example. Keisha, when she got to be 14, had to choose a high school in Milwaukee. You can choose where you go. And she chose a crosstown high school that required her to take two city buses, a 90-minute commute on the other, you know, she lives on the near north side, this is on the far south side of Milwaukee. This is a terrible choice for Keisha. Keisha's a chronic truant, you know. Keisha needs to live across the street from the high school. Keisha needs to live in the high school. Keisha should not be living across town from the high school. So why is she doing it? Well, when Keisha was seven, her father went to prison for murder. She's now 14. He's been gone half her life. She's seen him three times in the intervening seven years. He's a stranger. He's somebody she barely knows. She writes letters. They're affectionate letters. He gets you know, letters back from her dad. But she had always promised him that someday she was going to grow up and become a lawyer and get him out of jail. And this high school has a pre-law program. So she's making a decision that's really detrimental to her education. It makes it that much harder for her to get to school out of this ongoing you know, need to feel like she's connecting with her father. In fact, she can't get to the school. Um, and it's one of the things that contributed to her dropping out early. Tragically, though, then Red, her, her younger brother, when he got to high school, Angie wanted him to be going to the same school as Keisha. So Angie sent him to Bayview. He starts going. He dropped out. Then the third son, Vaughn, got sent to the same school where he had to get up at 4.30 in the morning to try to get breakfast and get out the door and get, you know, across town. So it, it, uh, it was one of uh, an additional factor that, that, you know, sabotaged the kids' uh, high school ed education, this, this desire to connect with, uh, with their father. Um, you know, just, just one other example. I spent a lot of time thinking about Angie in the nursing home. What, what did Angie like about that? What made her connect uh, with, the, with, with these patients? What was it about this? She could work in a fast food place or something and make about the same amount of money. So I read some nursing home ethnographies, and there's a theory that people are drawn for non-economic rewards, that they've been caretakers of other people in their family, they, they, they like the experience of caretaking. You know, it's kind of a sophisticated theory that I had a lot of abstract, sophisticated theories about Angie's, um, uh, about Angie and her character development, and she met them all with derision, if not outright abuse. Uh, did you really go to college? Yeah. <clears throat> so I was trying to get my courage one day to ask Angie about her inner caretaker, you know. And <laughs> she's four foot eleven, but she's got a seven foot three voice. And, and uh, before I could even get it out, she says, I'll tell you why I became a nursing aide. It was because of my daddy. And in her case, he was somebody she hadn't been a caretaker for. He was a terrible alcoholic. She scarcely knew him. Uh, she been, hadn't seen him for several years, and he showed up on her doorstep right before she left Chicago and moved to Milwaukee. And she was astonished at how much he had deteriorated. He was literally at death's door. She said he was so weak she had to take him to the bathroom. And they spent two hours together on a park bench. She said it was the most tender two hours they had ever passed. <clears throat> Excuse me. And she never saw him again. Two weeks later, he was dead. She moved to Milwaukee. Next time she saw him was at, her, at his funeral. She said she felt so guilty that she hadn't been there to be a caretaker for her father that five years later, this is by her own account, she becomes a, a nursing aide in order to reenact a caretaking scenario with other people. I mean, <clears throat> if I had come up with that on my own and brought it to the Center for Advanced Study as my theory of Angie's motivation, I think I would uh, meet some appropriate skepticism. But coming from Angie, I thought it was a really profound um, statement to the importance of of uh, of that bond with you know, the economic, you know, one more statement about what's lost economically, psychologically, socially when the men are are, are essentially exiled from from the family life. Um, I'm happy to report that the one great redemption story in the book in involves a man. It involves Jewel's boyfriend Ken, the guy who was the drug dealer and the pimp, and Jewel just poured her heart into this relationship. The guy went to jail for two years. I was really hoping she was going to move on. I was convinced this was a mistake. I knew that the book was going to end with Ken getting out of prison, dumping her and going back to his 
harem and his in his uh, ways as a drug lord. And the appropriate, you know, the day finally comes. He's getting out of prison. Jewel has me drive her to the prison. It's two hours outside of Milwaukee in a small town, rural Wisconsin. We're driving up there. I'm thinking, you know, keep the map. We'll be back here soon. Yeah, guy spent his whole life in prison. He gets out. He comes back to Milwaukee. And <clears throat> a few days later, somebody drop, comes by the house and drops off a bag of cocaine. And it's like one of those Saturday morning cartoons, you know, an angel and a devil on each shoulder. Take it. Don't. Do it. Don't. And he's he wants the money. He wants the flash. But he really wants to stay out of prison. He's tired of being in prison. He gets rid of the, the drugs, and he goes on to become a pizza delivery man. Uh, he's been out now five and a half years, no new arrests. He's still delivering pizzas for it's a place called Gianelli and Chicken Man in <laughs> northwest Milwaukee. And he's like the one guy in the whole extended family who's there providing economically for the family. He's, uh, he, Jewel and Ken have a baby now, so Jewel works in the nursing home in the mornings. Ken takes care of the baby till three, then she comes home, he goes out and delivers pizza. Um, uh, the one so sad part is he's lost a little bit of respect from the teenagers. They looked up to him more when he was selling drugs. Uh, they kind of mock him behind his back now, you know, pizza delivery man. Um, but the, a really nice sort of aftermath of the book is I, I wrote a piece about him for the Times Magazine, New York Times Magazine, came out about a year ago. And Bill Cosby saw it and invited Ken to come. Cosby was going around giving some, doing some sort of inner city rallies, and he invited Ken to come talk at one of them. So Ken got to go. Um, this is a guy who's had no affirmation, you know, any time in his life and is get, gets mocked for doing the right thing. So he got to go speak to 2,000 people in Detroit. And, uh, and then Laura Bush saw it and got interested in it. And she went and did an event in Milwaukee and, uh, and had Ken and Jewel come and, and did a, did, stood up and said this, that Ken had uh, it sparked her interest in the problems of adolescent boys. And she's got a policy initiative of some sort in Washington. So I have to say, when I was first uh, met Ken and he was dealing Drugs and women. That you know, what came to my mind was not photo op with Laura Bush, but um, uh, one never knows where uh, where where, where uh, life's paths will lead. Uh, in closing, um, you know, I was so struck by Jewel's lack of surprise at her losing her health insurance and her um, having her wages garnished that. The, yeah, that thought has that, that that scene has stayed with me in, in many ways, and let me let me just end with a with a thought about it. The welfare revolution grew from the fear that the poor were mired in a culture of entitlement, stuck in a swamp of excessive demands, legal prerogatives, social due. There certainly was a culture of entitlement in American life, but it was scarcely concentrated at the bottom, as anyone following the wave of corporate scandals now knows. What really stands out about Angie and Jewel is how little they felt they were owed. They went through life acting entitled to nothing, not heat or lights, not medical care, not even three daily meals, and they scarcely complained. When welfare was there for the taking, they got on the bus and took it. When it wasn't, they made other plans. In ending welfare, the country took away their single largest source of income. They didn't lobby or sue. They didn't march or riot. They made their way against the odds into wearying, underpaid jobs, and that does now entitle them to something, to a shot at the American dream more promising than the one they've received. Thank you very much. Jason, we'll take a few questions. If you have a question, please come up to a microphone. Is this on? Okay. My question is, um, do you think your involvement in their life aided in their success? Like if you hadn't been there, knowing their personalities and the type of people they are, do you think they still would have succeeded the best way they could have, or did you sort of aid in that. And my second question is, um, when they ran low on um, money or food or, you know, when the lights were turned off, did you do anything to help or did you kind of let them, you know, <clears throat> feign their way? Yeah, that changed uh, my, my um, willingness to be involved in their life um, sort of changed over time. At first, I, I think I was very much in... Um, 
high charge New York Times kind of a mindset that I'm just here to observe. You know, I don't want to ch change anything. I mean, I knew that to some degree I was changing things by being there, of course, but um, I didn't want to get in and I wasn't there to be a social worker. I wasn't there to organize their lives. I was there to observe their lives. Um, this is a story about the difference between a, a journalist and a good person. My, my wife came out to visit uh, when I was first getting to know Angie and Jewel. We uh, came out to, to Milwaukee. And uh, my wife was a health policy official in the Clinton administration at the time. And, and there was a new program in Wisconsin for uh, working for health care, health insurance for the working poor called Badger Care. And Angie, of course, was about health insurance. So one of the questions about Badger Care was would the working poor know it existed and would they find their way into the system? So I wanted to give it a little time to see if that was going to happen with Angie. You know, maybe not forever, but a little time. And Nancy Ann came out. And Angie said something about not having health insurance. And Nancy Ann says, oh, well, there's Badger Care. Would you like me to help take you down tomorrow, help sign you up? I was kicking her under the table. You know? uh, at first, I wanted to just let things unfold. Um, over time, I think two things happened. One, uh, just at a human level, it became more natural to, you know, as you, I, 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 I followed Angie, Opal, and Jewel for seven years. So over time, it became more natural to, to, to People would ask my opinion, I'd give it, and my involvement sort of grew. Um, and the other thing that happened, I think, is I began to realize um, that my influence was pretty marginal, that maybe this isn't an optimistic statement, or, or put, put, put differently, the problems, the dynamic in the household was so entrenched and the problems were so many that it wasn't like just by me being there and offering my thoughts on something was going to change a whole lot. I, we, uh, at one point, I got uh, towards the end of the reporting. I was trying to get the kids into a boarding school, and went flat out if, uh, for more than a year trying to get Angie interested and and get the kids interested. And finally, took them out. With the, the school was in Colorado, and took everybody out there. And in the end, they still decided not to go. So, I, I wound up um, uh, being, I think, uh, humbled in my own uh, uh, opinion of my abilities as a, as a social worker. Um, you asked about food. Certainly. Food, food. I always felt comfortable. Uh, I always felt comfortable buying meals. Maybe that's just such a um, time-honored journalistic tradition. You know, taking somebody to, to dinner. That so the night when the big fight broke out with uh, with Keisha and Marcus, and I realized everybody was hungry. Um, I didn't hesitate to go to go to Popeyes and bring back uh, a bunch of chicken, or you know, to, uh, other times I would order order a pizza. That that always felt more comfortable. But stuff like paying car bills or getting people signed up for health insurance or. Um, at the beginning, certainly, I, I held back, and it evolved a little bit. Uh, sir, in your in your very excellent book, you touch on a couple of themes that I would be grateful to hear you say more about. Uh, one is that uh, an inevitable uh, trope in discussions of social welfare policy is the extent of individual responsibility for one's situation versus the extent to which society uh, owes uh, people who are on the margin some kind of assistance. And I'd like to hear more about the insights you may have gained uh, about that topic. Um, the second one that I noticed uh, in your book uh, that uh, connects a little bit with what you were saying just now about the men, and that is to say that there is a very high level of chaos in the lives of the people whom you looked at. And uh, you reported toward the end of, of the book that some of the programs that seemed to be most helpful to these people were programs that pulled people out of that chaos. Uh, a good after-school program, or indeed a program that would take an entire family out of an impoverished neighborhood. And uh, I'd like to know if you uh, uh, could talk a little bit uh, more about that and about what its implications might be for public policy. Thank you. Well, uh, one benchmark that I keep coming back uh, to in my own thinking about uh, where, where the social paradigm is in terms of uh, do we have to help people or do people help themselves, is to go back to Clinton's thinking when he was signed the bill. I spent a lot of time trying to figure out why did Clinton do this and to what extent was it mere um, self-interest in an election year? Was he trying to save him, save himself politically or to what extent was this motivated by some grander vision? I did, it, it, obviously, it's complex and it's not either or, but in the end, I, th I, I did come to think that he had a, a less self-interested it, his his political lens on this wasn't mere self-interest. It may have included self-interest, but it also included a hope of shifting the paradigm that um, the discussion of poverty was stuck into society seeing people uh, who were equating poverty with welfare and thinking that people needed to get off their 
their duff and go do something for themselves. I think Clinton's hope was once you change that image from people of the poor from being, you know, I'm shirkers on welfare to workers off welfare, you'd be um, laying the groundwork for, for a much more sympathetic, much more healthy politics of poverty. And that um, rather than abandoning the poor as the left was charging, you'd be laying the groundwork for society to, uh, to help poor people in, in a much fuller, less conflicted way. Um, I don't think that has happened the way that Clinton had hoped it would, or it happened to a degree. I think the, the passage of the welfare bill um, and the movement of several million women like Angie off of welfare and into work has uh, erased a lot of the anger and the ugliness towards poor people that was um, there when I first came. I first started writing about this a couple of decades ago. I mean, there, particularly by the early 90s, there was a period of real you know, poor people bashing going on in the country. Um, an ugliness to the conversation. I don't think that's there. I think there's a sort of um, mostly inert but slightly latent uh, sympathy for poor people. But certainly the second phase didn't happen. The the uh, the the active policy and active politics of trying to to help the working poor. Um, maybe maybe uh, um, if I, in my more hopeful uh, moments, I'll I, I hope that something like Hurricane Katrina and the the sympathy that people have shown since then might be might be a jolt in that direction the, the other thing you mentioned was w in terms of uh, taking poor people out of the uh, of the uh, of, of an environment with, where their um, aspirations are uh, or where they meet a lot of uh, um, negative behaviors and where their aspirations aren't always uh, affirmed and, and putting them getting people physically removed from the inner city um, as much as uh, as much as I would, I wanted to see that happen. I mean, my own experience with Angie's kids showed how hard it was to do that. They were really reluctant to leave home. Um, you have a huge natural experiment now about to occur with all these uh, Katrina evacuees, and it'll be interesting to see to what extent um, they're accepted in their communities and to what extent uh, the, their presence provokes a backlash. Uh, yes, sir. I have a couple of questions for you, real quickly. Um, the first question that I have is like. I want to pose it in the form of a counterfactual. And um, by that, I mean, can you counterfactualize this? Now, you had mentioned before that you said um, that these people in general were more able to work than you necessarily thought initially and liked working more than you thought initially, et cetera. Um, the question that I have is, is that um, if the racially and ethnic charge rhetoric that you had alluded to before but kind of glossed over um, in regards to welfare reform, happened in the manner, didn't happen in the manner in which it ultimately manifested. Um, can you talk about some of the implications for those of us on both politically the left or the political right about issues of color blindness? Because you kind of hinted at that. And then also to the second question that I have related to that, which flows from that, is a bit of when you talk about like your journalistic um, skills and the integrity and all of those things that you used, because on a certain level, and I'm not saying you're doing this consciously, but even if you're doing so unconsciously, it seems to be uh, glossing over some like implicit and explicit racial stereotyping to me. And the reason why I say this is having grown up in situations similar to, and I've already read your book, these different types of things, and I think some other people in here can attest, like when you classify someone as a drug dealing pimp, and we know that the rhetoric and things about this, but in general, by and large, these, t these two things are antithetical. <clears throat> Generally, people either pimp or deal drugs. They're not usually manifested in the same person because if you are a pimp, you don't want your girls, whores, whatever you have, to be hooked on drugs. In the same way, you wouldn't want a pimp, if you're around drug dealers, to be around your sister, your mother, et cetera, et cetera. And so the reason why I ask that in there is not to test your street credibility necessarily, but I ask it in a way as to say, how did these particular things come about a way and colored, no pun intended, the way you asked these particular questions and went through things of that nature? Um, I think one of your questions is why, why did I focus on African American, uh, African American family? Well, no, that, that's not so the question would be is how did these implicit and explicit racial categories, situations that came about both from the Gingrich camp and both from the Clinton camp, talking about issues of mobility and all these things, how do do you find counterfactualizing these would have manifested differently if these ethnic and racial um, subtexts were not used? And what is the implication for these for colorblindness? Um, 
I, I, uh, I, I wrestled a lot with whether or not to focus on African American family. Um, and the decision to do so uh, really was a decision to focus on uh, Milwaukee. I, fo I chose Milwaukee first and Mil because, because Milwaukee was the place where the welfare bill got implemented first and most aggressively. And in Milwaukee, three quarters or so of the families are, are uh, the welfare families were African American. So uh, that took me uh, to an African American. That's sort of how I wound up with an African American family. And at first, I worried whether it would um, uh, have the effect of reinforcing negative stereotypes, and I, uh, whether that was a, uh, a negative um, uh, for the book. I decided in the end it was probably a, a positive because um, race was so deeply implicated in the welfare, in the politics of welfare, that um, I thought it helped to to uh, to have a, an African American family. To, I mean, the race was implicated in the welfare story from start to finish, from the creation of the uh, of the uh, welfare program and uh, when it was uh, when when civil rights protections were. Uh, uh, cut out of it so that uh, black women could, because the Southern Congressional Delegation wanted black women to stay in the fields, uh, you know, on through its abolition. That um, you know, the, the two subjects were, were intimately tied throughout. So in the end, I thought it it, it, it helped to tell the story um, to have an African American family. Your 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 question is, I, I'm I know involved on more levels than that. I'm sorry we don't have a full time to go into it, but um, Win Win booked me on a uh, six o'clock flight. I think we're, we're doing a magic uh -huh. trick of returning Jason to his own family, and I know you all have many more serious questions for him, but I thank you for holding them, and we thank Jason for being with us. So,